If you're anything like me, you haven't given much thought to the Reserve Bank of Australia, apart from when it changes official interest rates following its monthly meetings. The role and importance of the RBA and its governor, Philip Lowe, is little understood or even acknowledged. But the Reserve Bank is now facing rare criticisms by leading economists for not having met its core targets for nearly a decade. And this week, international think tank, the OECD, has called for a review of the RBA, a call since endorsed by Treasurer Josh Frydenberg who said he'd consider a review after the next election. And with the federal ALP previously calling for an independent review of the Reserve Bank in April, it's increasingly likely that the RBA will next year face its first independent review in 40 years. I'm Kat Clay, Head of Digital Communications, and with me is Brendan Coates, Economic Policy Program Director, to explain a few acronyms and whether or not a review is warranted here. Welcome, Brendan. Hi, Kat. So let's understand the key players here first. What exactly is the Reserve Bank? What does it do and why does it matter? Well, it is something that we don't think about particularly often, particularly if you're not in the sort of the annals of thinking about economic policy all the time. But the Reserve Bank is Australia's central bank. It's uh, in charge of essentially making sure that the economy runs smoothly um, and it has three main functions or main purposes. So, so its main objectives are to maintain the stability of the currency, which basically means keep inflation in check, um, to ensure full employment, and then a very broad idea of furthering the economic prosperity and well-being of the people of Australia. So, look, these are some pretty lofty goals. Now, at various times through history, the Reserve Bank has sought to fulfil these objectives using different targets, different tools. Since the early 1990s, it's basically set official interest rates, uh, which is the main policy lever it uses. So the price that you pay for your mortgage, the price that businesses pay for if they want to take out a loan, so the interest rate, to basically try to um, target inflation of between 2 and 3% on average over time. And by doing that, it's that if you're hitting the inflation target of roughly between 2 and 3%, uh, that's normally a sign that the economy is roughly running at full employment. So you've got as many people in work as possible. It gives um, workers the best chances of seeing wage rises and it sort of basically allows stability of the economy over time. Now, the difference between when the RBA is doing its job well and doing its job badly is, is, you know, the difference between hundreds of thousands of Australians in jobs or not. And for the rest of us, it's the difference between the rest of us getting wages rises or wage rises or not over time. So if you think of the periods in over the last hundred years when the economy has done particularly badly, the Great Depression, you know, the 1990s recession under Paul Keating, for the rest of the world, less so Australia, um, the global financial crisis and what's called the Great Recession, they've typically been about failures of macro policy where the economy hasn't been run at full employment. And there's an old saying that basically says it takes a heap of Harburger triangles to fill an Oaken's gap, which is a really nerdy way of saying, you know, you've got to get lots of efficiencies in the economy um, if you're going to um, offset the impact of a big recession. So recessions are really costly. Periods where the economy is not running at full potential are incredibly costly to the, not just at the at a point in time, but over time. So if you have a period of high unemployment, it tends to be persistent. It tends to affect people's wages five, ten years down the track. It affects economic performance in the long term. So that's why we want to make sure that macro policy works well, and that's why the Reserve Bank is so important. And when you put it that way, I mean, when you're talking about wages, growth, and jobs. There's a good reason I should be interested in what the RBA is doing, even though it feels a little bit mysterious. Now, there's another acronym I like to pretend I know what it is, but really, in honesty, I'm not exactly sure what they do. I've heard the term a lot, OECD, but what is it anyway, and what do they do? So the OECD, it's it's the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development. It's basically a a club of rich countries. So it started off with a few members post-World War II, Australia was one, and increasingly as more countries have become sort of more developed, advanced economies, a number of countries have joined, like the South Koreas and the Taiwans of the world. Now, it's um, it's a think tank of bureaucracy that's actually based in Paris. Um, and what they do is they go to each member country every couple of years and they do a survey of how well the country is doing um, where the country can Im- can improve. So we talked to the OECD at Grattan. So when they came and they've done this one in every three-year survey of the Australian economy that was released this week, 
you know, they speak to us, they speak with the Treasury, they speak with the Reserve Bank, they speak with a lot of stakeholders. And then what their job is, is to basically recommend or support sort of evidence-based reforms. It's not that different to what Grattan does. Um, and so the OECD has come out and basically said, you know, you should do a review of monetary policy and that that review should be broad in scope. It should include a, a, an assessment of the, the mandate of the central bank, the tools it's using, and also things like even its hiring processes and internal structures, so the governance structures. So it's quite a broad call for review. It's the first time that at least that I can recall that the reserve, that the OECD has actually recalled for such a review of the Reserve Bank and monetary policy in Australia. Popping into that, I mean, it's not uncommon that reviews of reserve banks happen. I mean, that's happened in other countries as well, right? It's not just they're calling out Australia at the moment. Well, Australia is a bit of an outlier in being one of the few that hasn't actually had a review recently. So most of what you call the major central banks, the major economies have, have had reviews. So the, you know, uh, the UK Treasury did one of the of in the UK. Uh, the US Federal Reserve has just finished up a review recently. You've got, you know, the Bank of Japan, New Zealand. It's not so much a major central bank, but a, a peer, similar kind of country to Australia. They've all done these reviews. The bank, the the European Central Bank as well. And so we are an outlier in, in not having done one. And it's also been a long time since there's been a, a proper review of the monetary policy framework in Australia that's been done outside the bank. It's basically 40 years since that last happened. So 40 years is a long time between drinks here. Why are there calls for this review of the Reserve Bank now? There's probably two reasons. Uh, the first is, you know, they probably haven't done as well as they should have in the last few years. Now, there's always benefits in hindsight. Um but it is pretty clear that if you an objective assessment of of the Reserve Bank in the last few years is it really hasn't lived up to to its um, its objectives, it hasn't met its targets. So you know for the most of the last thirty years or up until like the last decade essentially, the Reserve Bank was pretty effective in hitting its inflation target. Um, whereas in recent years that hasn't been the case. So they haven't hit their inflation target of keeping inflation sort of that two to three year band. For basically the last seven years, and based on the forecasts, they're unlikely to do so um, before Phil Lowe's term ends, which is supposed to be in 2023. Now, that has real-world consequences. So, persistently low inflation basically means the economy is not running as hot as it could. Um, you know, so before COVID, the unemployment rate was a good percentage point higher than what the Reserve Bank now thinks um, it could have been at. And that's the difference between a pay rise for a lot of Australians and not. So most Australians haven't seen meaningful pay rises for most of the last decade. You know, real wages, so that's wages after adjusting for inflation have only risen by about 0.5% a year in the five years leading up to COVID. Um, and our work, which is ongoing now, because we are actually getting more into the macroeconomic policy space now, which is why we're doing this podcast, is you know roughly half, something like half of the slowdown in wages growth since sort of 2012 is really been because the economy hasn't run a potential. And so you're talking about given that wages aren't expected to rise again substantially by the Reserve Bank until say 2024, it's almost like a lost decade of, you know, weak wages growth, weak inflation, the higher unemployment than it needed to be, even if unemployment has now since COVID come down to below where we thought it was before, uh, but where it was previously, you know, the estimates are that, you know, you could probably run the unemployment rate at 4% or less and before you start to see stronger wages growth. Before COVID, it was running at five. Now it's at 4.5, but things are a bit weird in the labour market data because of lockdowns. Uh, so it suggests you've got a fair way to go before you're going to hit full employment. And that's one of the reasons why the Reserve Bank, you know, is under fire. And that's why uh, we're looking at reviews. So, Brendan, you've made it pretty clear that a lot of these issues have been going on for uh, longer than, say, the pandemic. But are a lot of the issues that might get flagged in a review and the RBA is facing a product of the pandemic? Like this is unprecedented times, you know, we couldn't have predicted this happening. Is that a, the case here? Well, it's ironic that probably since the pandemic, the Reserve Bank's done a better job than what it, you would probably, an honest assessment would say in the years leading up. So, you know, when COVID hit in March 2020, um, I was to be honest, quite terrified that we were going to see a financial crisis, that what would happen is as we shut the shut the borders, locked everything down, obviously people weren't going to work, so they're not getting income. I was very worried that that would lead to a flow on financial hit because basically people wouldn't be paying their debts, businesses wouldn't be paying each other, and you kind of get the kind of experience you saw during the global financial crisis. Now, that didn't happen in large part because the Reserve Bank, you know, pulled out all the, the whole playbook of what it had used during the global financial crisis and just 
you know, put it into action within a couple of weeks in the second half of March of last year. So during COVID, they've probably done a better job. Now they've they've still not gone as far as what you might want them to go in sort of using the tools that they have to to get back to full employment faster to get inflation up. You know, they've been buying bonds, which is if the normal way that a central bank controls the economy is it raises interest rates up and down. Interest rates are now it's essentially at zero. The cash rate, so the official um, rate interest rate the Reserve Bank controls is at 0.1%. Now, that leaves not a lot of room for it to go lower. Um, what they've done instead is they've focused on things like buying more bonds in the, um, in the market, which essentially is a way of bringing down other interest rates as well. Um, but they probably haven't gone as far as we perhaps would have liked because there's still a long way before they're going to get back to full employment. But COVID itself has probably brought forward the need for a review as well because um, if you're at the zero lower bound, if you can't bring interest rates any lower, other countries have gone to negative rates and that's something we should, we should think about. But it's there's fewer things you can do conventionally to, for the Reserve Bank to fight, support the economy. Um, we've obviously had governments build up um, increased uh, levels of debt as they've borrowed to, to fund JobKeeper and all the other supports uh, that were necessary to keep the economy going during COVID. So there's real questions about what happens now. Like how does a um, how does the the central bank, how does the government support the economy when those monetary and fiscal policy buffers have been eroded the way that they have been? And I found that really interesting in something you sent to me, which was that Switzerland had gone to negative interest rates. I didn't even know that was a thing. I mean, I mean, would you see something like that happening here, or is that is that just you know? completely nuts for Australia. Well, it's actually something that we've called for in a sense, which is to say that these policies have been used abroad. So, you know, in Denmark now, one in four new mortgages for, that you you take out to if you're buying a house has a negative interest rate. So the actual interest rate on paper is negative. Now, it's worth remembering just to back up slightly that interest rates can go negative in the sense that inflation can be higher than the interest rate, which means that you know, you might lend, I might lend you $100 and then when you're repaying that money to me, the interest rate that you're paying is lower than the rate of inflation. So, you know, you're paying me less than the amount of what I'm losing on inflation in the intervening period. So when it comes to Australia and negative rates, we think it's something the government should be thinking about. The Bank of International Settlements, which is, um, you know, basically a club of central bankers, has essentially suggested in some of its, some of the work that um, that these these policies work. Uh, Phil Lowe hasn't wanted to go there. He's worried about some of the downside risks. Um, but you can go there. And, you know, for those that say, well, house prices are at rec- uh, sort of have done their dash because interest rates can't go lower, there are countries where they've gone lower and that can have a big impact on prices. So it's not clear where we go from here, um, but certainly negative rates are one thing that we could do. And I mean, a review isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's not just about dissecting mistakes. What are the opportunities for reform and change out of a review like this? And, and where, what would that change look like for you? So a review isn't just about looking in the review mirror, although that's part of it because you do need to understand why uh, things have maybe gone awry. Um, some of these things are benefit uh, the mistakes in the past um, are things that are the have become clear with the benefit of hindsight. Now we now know more clearly that um, the unemployment rate could have gone lower before wages um, and inflation would have picked up. Um, but there's also questions about the governance of the bank itself. So there's a board of the Reserve Bank that's appointed by the Treasurer that essentially manages or oversights the, board, the Reserve Bank's activities. They sit in on the monetary policy discussion. So that when, when the, the Reserve Bank makes a decision every month on interest rates, it's not the governor, it's the governor plus the board and the deputy governor. But the Reserve Bank board's an outlier and it's mainly being composed of, of business people who don't have a lot of expertise in monetary policy. That's actually very rare globally. Most central bank boards are made up of people who know monetary policy really well. And if they're not experts, it's people that are both from the business side and from the labor union side. And at the moment, we haven't had a a labor unionist since Bill Gelty was on the board more than 20 years ago. Um, But beyond that, there are also challenges with monetary policy generally. You know, the tool that they use to keep interest rates, to, to manage the economy is interest rates. Now, as interest rates have fallen, monetary policies become less potent. Um, and interest rates have fallen, um, not just because of the decisions of central banks, but also just because globally, the, you should think about interest rates as being about a balance between savings and investment. And as you have aging populations, more wealth inequality, 
um, you tend to have more demand for savings, so supply, so more supply of savings than demand for savings in the form of investment, and that means real rates fall. And so central banks both in Australia and around the world have had trouble keeping meeting their inflation targets in recent years, but the Reserve Bank's been worse at it than most. Um, and so it raises questions about whether central banks have the tools to actually manage the macro economy, those fluctuations in the economy over time, to be able to cut rates, if they can't cut rates during a recession, if they don't have that ability. And that leads to questions about, okay, well, what role does fiscal policy play? So if monetary policy is about setting interest rates and the money supply, fiscal policy is about government spending and um, taxation, about government borrowing. And historically, we've relied upon a separation between those two. We've outsourced to the Reserve Bank to run the macro economy and then governments are about you know making sure taxes are efficient that we're spreading you know wealth fairly across the economy through redistribution um maybe that 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 sort of separation is starting to fray a little bit uh, in part because central banks are buying the bonds um, of the government in as part of its um, unconventional monetary policy but also because if we're at the zero lower bound and there's not much that central banks can do then the way you probably solve that problem is you get governments to spend more, um, which means they add more demand to the economy just by you know b- borrowing and spending, a bit like what we did with the um, Roosevelt did during the New Deal in the United States, and that that's how you would get the economy running more strongly. That's how you get inflation up. Ironically, if you get inflation up, then the zero low about is less of a problem because if if if, the, if inflation's running at two percent and interest rates are at zero, then effectively the real rate is negative two. If inflation's at 3% and interest rates are at zero, effectively the real rate is negative 3%. And so there are real questions about how what role does fiscal policy have? Do we keep independence between monetary and fiscal policy during this period? Um, how else can we get the economy running at full potential, given that those long-term drivers of interest rates globally, what Larry Summers calls secular stagnation, isn't going away as far as we can tell anytime soon. So, Brendan, correct me if I'm wrong here, but are you suggesting that uh, government should play more of a hand in managing the RBA here? And, I mean, if you're suggesting that, like, if the RBA already has a communications issue, would that be improved by being involved with government more, which has a significant problem with the lack of transparency? Well, this is a great question, Kat, um, because... The reason why we've separated monetary policy and fiscal policy is because we didn't f- trust politicians so much with the tools of macro policy because they'd want to run the economy too hot to get wages up and that would be in their interest in the short term but might lead to more inflation in the long term. So what we saw in the 1970s was what we called stagflation, very low rates of growth but very high rates of inflation and that's kind of what led to the current regime that we have. So it's not necessarily about breaking down the structural separation between the two but like it's questions like how can fiscal policy act more like monetary policy? How can fiscal policy can you use more automatic stabilizers in the budget? So, you know, there are proposals for things like should the rate of unemployment benefits vary um, based on the state of unemployment in the economy, so that you're putting more money or less money into the economy on an on the fiscal side, irrespective of based on the the, the where the macro economy is at. Because there's, it'd be a big call to to separate though, um, to break the separation between monetary and fiscal policy. But how can governments, through the fiscal rules that they adopt, you know, which say how they're going to, you know, guide spending and um, and revenue over time and debt, how do they, those policies need to change in response to um, in the the problem of secular stagnation? So you know, the government has said that they're going to keep. Run, supporting their recovery until unemployment gets down to sort of pre-COVID levels. And then the, 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 the current plan is to switch to fiscal consolidation to basically stabilising debt as a share of GDP and bringing debt down over time. Is that appropriate in a world where if the Reserve Bank can't push the economy to full employment? Yeah, and I think just bringing that back home as well, I mean, when it comes down to, I mean, this is a question of people having jobs or not and people, and it does have a significant flow-on effect, obviously, to people's housing, people's stability, their income, their children and families. So it's something that I think we'll probably talk more about as um, the next few months and years progress um, and your work in macro continues as well. Just finally, I mean, what should a review look like here? I mean, should we be getting, you know, some internal guys from the RBA to do this review or who, who should be doing this for us? 
given the fact that a review is probably going to look at some of the the past policy mistakes from the bank, you probably don't want the Reserve Bank itself doing a review. Other central banks have done their reviews um, and have been very open about it. Um, so, you know, Jerome Powell's the the chair of the US Federal Reserve. He's done a review and that, that's been, um, you know, quite ref- retrospective and looking at, and reflective on the mistakes that they've made previously. Um, I probably favor a view that doesn't just involve the central bank, partly because it's got to have expertise from people who know monetary policy well and people who know fiscal policy well. You probably want to look abroad as well. So it's not necessarily the case that the person who needs to lead a review needs to be in Australia. There are plenty of uh, very high profile former central bankers elsewhere. You know, you had the former head of Mark Carney, the former head of the Bank of Canada, become the head of the Bank of England. Um, so people do move in these positions abroad. Uh, but you probably want a couple of things. One is you want someone who knows the Australian economy really well. So Australia is a small open economy, which is to say that we're a commodity exporter. Um, so exchange rates matter a lot for the economy. You want someone who knows that well. You you want someone who knows monetary policy well, and you probably want someone that knows fiscal policy pretty well too. But getting an independent review, a different independent panel to look at that is probably better than getting the Reserve Bank to do it themselves. Uh, just because I think it'll give more confidence and trust in the process as much as anything else. Thank you so much, Brendan, for shedding light on why the RBA should be reviewed here. It's a mysterious topic sometimes for anyone who's not acquainted with monetary and fiscal policy, but I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. You can continue the conversation with us on Twitter at Grattan Inst and on social media at Grattan Institute. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please follow us on your favourite podcasting app or program. We wish you very well from the Grattan team and thank you so much for listening.